Welcome to the Legends of Iron. I'm John Anderson. Meet my co-hosts, Nick Best and Aki Williams. We're going to have some amazing guests on the show. Buckle up tight, because we're going to be talking about the shit you're not supposed to be talking about. We're going to be discussing anything and everything it takes to become a legend of iron. Legends of Iron is brought to you by Muscle Mitch, the creator of Nitro Test. Nitro Test is hands down the most fucking kick-ass free workout on the market. The question is, can you fucking handle it? Welcome to another edition of Legends of Iron. I am John Anderson with me always, my partners in crime, Nick Best, who's sitting right next to me today. And of course, Akeem Williams. We have got a killer, killer show for you today. This guy has been at the top of the pro strongman circuit for a long time. One intense individual, let me tell you. Nick and I both know we've competed with him and against him many times. He has been a pro since, I believe, 2004. So he's been in the game a long time. He had a little hiatus from the sport, but he is back now. Travis Ortmeyer, welcome to the show, my brother. How are you? I'm doing well, man. It's uh, it's nice to see y'all. And I gotta I gotta say real quick, you know your your setup over there. You guys are looking <laughs> fancy. Who put that together? Because I know it wasn't you. <laughs> you, know, you know, funny funny enough, about thirty minutes ago, because I'm in Vegas for this weekend. About thirty minutes ago, I pulled up. Terry's off shopping right now. She dumped me off here. And we, Nick and I started piecing this shit together, and somehow we did it. So yes, I don't know how, but we did it. Man, man no, old dogs right. can do. Old dogs That's can it. learn new tricks, man. I love it. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> well, brother, we're really excited to have you on the show. But let's dive right in. Let me set the stage. All right. You turned pro as a youngster. Absolutely started yeah. crushing the pro circuit, <clears throat> and you were doing this for a long time. Then. Somewhere along the lines, there was some sort of penetration, uh, outside influence that kind of took you off the wrong track. I'm going to let you tell the story. I know because I was there with you, but I'm going to let you tell the story. So talk to us what happened. You're at the top. You're literally at the top of the world competing as a pro strong man. What happened? You know, so people say there was an outside influence that kind of threw me off track. I don't know if it was an outside influence or if it was just true blue self-destruction, man. <laughs> it was uh, <coughs> maybe all of the above, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I guess there was some influence that gave me the choice of which avenue I chose to self-destruct. So, <laughs> but I take yeah. full responsibility for my life and everything that's happened. Um, I think, well, you like you said at the beginning, I'm I'm a pretty kind of intense individual and uh, i brought that with me every single time <laughs> come, I on. Come, <laughs> on. come on That's the year. you have your own land. you have your own land to set up for you you have travis land set up for you <laughs> yeah. i forgot yeah. about so he's that up with travis that's it, that's it. <laughs> i mean the announcers used to say travis we ask him how he does it because he's so much younger you said you literally used to tell them that you would get yourself so riled up with mind games, which you would do. You'd go from this really chill dude to look like, you know, you were like a dog with rabies foaming out the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> All in about two minutes. Yeah. You know? I did. I had a good uh, switch that I could flip, man. And, you know, sometimes it was great. Sometimes that berserker mode really paid off. And then sometimes it, uh, it worked against me, I guess. <laughs> but, um, you know, kind of, I think what what happened with that, going back to what you were talking about a minute ago, kind of that, that fall in the peak of my career, um, because I was so intense so often, every time I trained, yeah. every time I competed, and I competed yeah. probably three to five times more than any any other American out there. I was always competing. I mean, I was doing 18 shows a year for several years. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. in Europe, that's okay, because you're just bouncing from one little, like, state to state almost. But <clears throat> as an American doing that many shows, I'm flying overseas each time and coming back. Yeah. And after a few years, uh, I'd say, really, like, by the end of 2011, that had weighed on me so much. Um, mm. 
you know, several injuries <clears throat> throughout the, the whole ordeal. Uh, a really bad one in the finals of World's Strongest Man 2010 with uh, mm -hmm. that broken ankle halfway through the final. You know, I chose to stay in. I chose to keep competing. I still held on for fifth, but I paid dearly for it. And uh, <clears throat> competing all of 2011 was just miserable. And by the time 2012 came around, I hated going to the gym. I hated training. I was in so much just pain all the time. Um, you know, and that, at that point, I had a, a painkiller addiction that was weighing pretty heavily on me, too. <clears throat> you know, you, you kind of throw those together, and then you add <clears throat> the, uh, the furthering, you know, facts of the matter was my, my wife at the time and I had started kind of splitting apart. We started growing apart, you know. That's one of the things I tell people about painkillers is it doesn't just – numb the pain yeah. it numbs your emotions and it will yeah. kill your your relationships absolutely <laughs> absolutely <clears throat> you know on that level brother i just want to kind of join in and, and explain that you know when you came in you're you're a solid 10 years younger than i was and we went to europe a lot together <clears throat> and yeah. many many plane trips home you know you're beat up you know the doctors have given us plenty of medication to feel good for the plane ride home and obviously, <laughs> if you don't have the fucking discipline at 25, at your age, I wouldn't have had it. You know, the difference was I was 10 years older. And so obviously, you know, having that type of, a, you know, get started, the doctor gives you something that seems OK. Next thing you know, the problem's kind of yeah. ramped up as I've had to fight my way out of multiple painkiller addictions. The difference was I was old enough to have the, the wherewithal to see you were so young. I sympathize, you know. You know, you bring up a good point where it, it kind of becomes, I wouldn't say normal, but almost the norm, you know, yeah. to have something to fly home with. And, and when I was offered. That was very normal. Very normal. <laughs> when, yeah, exactly. when I was offered a way to get painkillers on a regular basis with a local doctor, <clears throat> um, I took it. You know, I was like, this, this could be great. You know, I could. Uh, save up and i have many time i fly i can use them on really stressful training days when when you know i'm still sore whatever but you know as much as i'd love to blame the doctor who gave them to me gave me the prescription on my way over to that first appointment i had for the first time probably in my life at least since i could remember sorry second time but i had this little voice come up and say this is a bad idea. You know, this, this is not a good idea. And I quickly was like, well, that's weird. I, you know, who's talking to you? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, come on, man. Yeah. I like, what to shut up right now. I got to create the connection coming here. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what it was. And then two weeks later, you know, it was like before I knew it, I was, uh, I'd run out of my prescription and I'm like, feeling like trash going, oh, man, this sucks. I need to get more. And what I know now is that I was addicted at that point, and those were withdrawal symptoms. So, you know, yeah. some of it comes with age. I would love to have kind of had this knowledge back then. Um, mm. Could have saved me a lot of trouble because I would have known, hey, you just put up with a few days of feeling like shit, get mm. over it, and kill this early. Uh, but I ended up fighting through that addiction and trying to quit several times, but you just feel so awful and you think that it's never going to end because I had, I had no one to talk to at least as far as I knew, you know, I didn't one, I didn't want to tell anybody because it's such a taboo subject to say, Hey, I'm addicted to something. And two, I didn't know anybody offhand that I could speak to in the process that could kind of give me some insight as to what to expect, which is, you know why I talk about my situation a lot because if we can remove the taboo, it's like people fuck up, man. It's okay to fuck up. Yeah, you know exactly. Here's let's find mm -hmm. let's get the information out there so that mm -hmm. you don't have to keep fucking up. So you don't have to go so far as to start to to kind of yes end up on a crash course, so to speak. <clears throat> it's okay to raise your hand and say I need help. And yeah. that's what, yeah. where would, if you had had that advice at the right time, you would have caught it early enough. And that's unfortunately, that's, that's why your story is so powerful, brother, because we all know that there's people out there that are just so close to putting their hand up, say, I need some help, but they need to hear something like this to actually help them have the strength to do it. So 
you talking about this stuff, it's 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 paramount in, in the world we live in today because you know we're as we consume as USA, we consume almost all of the pain medication in the world. So we know you yeah. we know you're talking to people who need to hear this. You were eighty percent, eighty percent of the yeah. world's pain some medicine. Crazy, uh, yeah, some crazy three percent about. of the population. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. man. It's kind of sad. Yeah. <clears throat> but you know, and it it's that concept right there goes farther than you know addiction. It goes as far as ending generational, you know, trauma where yeah. people sweep things under the rug from one generation to the next. Parents don't talk to their kids because they don't want to seem like you know, one, that they're human, and two, that they could make mistakes. So they don't talk to their kids about their mistakes. They sweep yeah. it under the rug, and then the kid makes the same mistake. And it goes so far as, you know, I've thought about this a lot. If, you know, like, uh, like, like sexual predators, most of the time it's like child molesting situations or being raped as a child by a family member or something yeah, like it's that. It's inside the family. It, Isn't that crazy? It's, and it's, and it, it just goes generation after generation because they're like, hush, hush, we need to cut this off. Don't tell yeah. anybody because that's embarrassing. Yeah. If you, you know, I know that's an extreme mm. circumstance, but if you start talking about these things, yes, you cut it off. You cut it off. Yes. You say, hey, look, you've got a problem. I'm sorry this happened to you, but it ain't going to happen to the next generation. We're not going to let this shit continue. <clears throat> so <laughs> anyway, that's the that's my little rant that I get on because you know, I see so much of it just hidden. And, yeah. you know, there's, you know, other things in my own life that I wouldn't have felt so alone when my wife left me and took my son, you know, here I was thinking that I was all alone in the world and, and people would say, Oh man, I know how you feel. But I know you got a divorce, but you guys didn't have kids. You don't have a fucking clue how I feel. Kiss my ass, you know? Yeah. You don't know what it's like to have a child <laughs> right. away from you. Yeah. So, you know, that would make me mad. But, you know, just some of the things that happened in my own parents life, like my mom could have told me a couple things, and I wouldn't have felt so freaking alone in that situation. I think that that could have had a big effect on me. You know, just uh, yeah. I know I've taken this kind of <laughs> no, bro. It's, level, no, it's, it's, but, uh, this is all good because when it comes down to it, <clears throat> obviously we're going to. Everybody knows you, Travis, the world elite strongman. But to know you on a different level is what this is all about. I mean, yeah. people can go can go to you know strongman archives and see you compete. But this is really what this is who Travis is. You know, not competing, and then and this is the pearls of of wisdom that you're throwing on the world. So this is good stuff, and I totally agree with you, brother. You know, sometimes as a parent, we need to say, look, you know, and I, I've actually told my kids, I said, you know, I've had multiple painkiller addictions and they are a son of a bitch. Don't start taking that stuff yeah. because you all you got to do is get three, four days past the pain and you leave that problem behind. You start taking those pills by day five. You need the pill to feel normal. And that's where the problem lies. And just for that's people that understand when Travis is talking about withdrawals, <clears throat> he's talking about. He needs the pill just to feel normal. You know, he, he's not trying to get high. He's not trying to kill pain. He's trying to not throw up, <laughs> yeah. you know? And yeah. so it, when, when the stuff gets you, so I know obviously you're, you're such a warrior. You competed through a ton of this. You competed for a few years battling all this. And then <clears throat> the whole thing obviously turned a corner and got even worse. So talk to us about that. Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> you know, the, the relationship with my wife got to the point where it was strained. Um, and it was strained to the point where she moved out. She moved out and stayed with a friend down the street. Um, at that point, we were still going to try and work things out. But her being from England and having a, a three-year-old child, she wanted to go home. I mean, that was, that was a big yeah. part of it. She wanted to go home. <clears throat> So I agreed, you know, I was going to, I was ready to move over there with her. We were going to start things fresh and I was going to be able to go over there and then force myself to end this with this uh, addiction because, you know, I, I didn't have the doctor hookup over there. Um, and I did, I was planning on not finding a hookup and that was kind of my plan. But yeah, <laughs> um, when she moved out, you know, at that point I was, I was a mess. 
I was a total mess. And, um, you know, it had been God, three years that I'd had this addiction or two years that I had that addiction. And, you know, you feel like a slave. You, you're, you are a slave. You, it's a monkey on your back. You can't get rid of it. And so there was a lot of things I tried to, uh, to kick that addiction. And when she had moved out, one of the things I tried, and it just happened by coincidence to actually help with the addiction, was uh, a friend of mine, a friend of mine had offered me <laughs> crystal meth. <laughs> Crystal meth. And this is a friend that I had known way back. And uh, he came back around and <clears throat> hung out a couple times. And, you know, I just uh, I noticed that when I was using crystal meth, I didn't need the painkillers. And I had no withdrawals from it. So my genius Perfect. way of thinking, I'm like, this is great. I can get over this fucking yeah. addiction. Finally. <laughs> get this monkey off my back. Cause I don't really need this. This is nothing. I just, you know, <laughs> I'll just kick the crystal meth to the side. Yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> it doesn't work. That it was about, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Traded one, one slave master for an even nastier slave master. Mm. And, uh, you know, there's a couple of, a, a couple of months where my wife lived at our friend's house and I gave me a lot of, free time to kind of dabble here and there. Mm. Um, so I guess it'd be kind of, it probably increased in frequency over that yeah. two month period. <clears throat> um, not all the time, but enough that when the absolute worst day of my life came, and that's the day that I took my, my ex-wife and my son to the airport, mm. most painful thing I've ever felt in my entire life. Cause that little voice in the back of my head was screaming at me again, saying, don't do this. This is a mistake. You know, the plan was take them to the airport. She's going to go over and get a house. I'm going to sell the house here. She's going to get things set up and I'm going to move over in, you know, a few weeks to a month. Um, but that voice just kept screaming at me. This is a mistake. It's a bad idea. And I remember, I remember, you know, pulling over to the, the drop off lane getting out, helping them with their luggage and seeing my son, you know, he's so excited because he's going on an adventure. You know, he, he'd been to England before, so he knew the deal. He knew what was going on, but <clears throat> this was an adventure to him. He's, he had that smile on his face. He had his little car, his backpack on and a little hat. And he just, he was cute as hell. My, I loved my son. I fucking loved my son. So, uh, when he grabbed his little suitcase and then she took his hand and they walked through those doors at the airport. And as soon as those doors closed behind them, that was like a big scar, a big gash opening up across my heart. I felt it like rip open and just tear my soul to pieces. It just, that moment shattered me. It hurt. It hurt so bad. I mean, I've had some serious injuries. I had a leg infection uh, that, that got septic. I had rabbit at the same time. That was the worst pain I'd ever felt, but it was nothing compared to the pain I felt that moment. And uh, it was so bad, I had to pull over on the way home and just kind of gather myself for a few minutes. Um, but when I got home, I said, all right, Travis, you know, this, this hurts. This sucks so bad. Tell you what, you can get as fucked up as you want for a week just get stupid hang out here in the house don't go anywhere get as high as you want <clears throat> and uh after that we're gonna get straight we're gonna start getting motivated and get out of this that week turned into four years wow that was uh yeah yeah that was that was <laughs> it was it was a yeah. perfect storm of just shit that could go wrong um mm. And that was no, I, I, the show that we tried to film too, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was kind of at the beginning. God, see, that was part of it. You know, uh, for those who don't know, Nick and I, uh, we had started working on a reality show. This is 2012, like August mm -hmm. of 2012 or September of 2012. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, the uh, you mean that Williams. show. Exactly. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Would have been a fun show, but I think it was uh, canceled because the Duck Dynasty guy 
screwed up and said something publicly and, and the, his manager was the one who was going to be our manager. And so he got blacklisted. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, just during that whole shooting, <clears throat> that time shooting, I was forced to have this smile on my face and then relive every fucking moment of that because they wanted that on TV. You know, they're like, how do you yeah. feel now? And I'm like, well, honestly, I want to go out and just kill myself uh, because I'm not happy. I'm fucking miserable. And I've got this, you know. In their eyes, brother, you were the perfect, you were the perfect character for their television show. Mm -hmm. They weren't thinking about what you were going through. They were thinking about good television, which, which is unfortunate, but you had to yeah. deal with all that. And I can't, I mean, brother, I, I mean, when, when you're sitting there describing what you're going through, when you said, I got home for me. That's where I just did my, my, I felt my heart drop to my stomach because you're home in your place where your family's supposed to be and you're by yourself, you know? So, you know, that, that term, uh, the silence was deafening. Yeah. You ever heard that before? So when I walked in and closed the door, it was silent in my house and it was like overwhelming. That silence yeah. was just oh my God. unbearable. Oh my God. And, you know, that's when I decided, okay, we're just going to get fucked up for a week and, and try and drown this out. Um, but, yes, I mean, you know, a perfect storm of things that could go wrong. So, you know, at that point, I was – obviously, my wife had taken my son and left me. Um, I couldn't – I wasn't training because I was just miserable with injuries and, like, my ankle hurting and all that stuff. And I was just – lost my passion basically i mean i've been working out since i was 11 years old at that point and now i was uh, it was when i was like 28 or 29. so the majority of my life had been spent training so wife's gone now, son's gone training's gone what's that no now people don't realize you would drop down to like 242. not by that point i was still 285 or so okay because we know about 285 but i had like <clears throat> Four percent body fat or something. I got pretty lean. <laughs> yeah. So when we put you on the scale while we were filming, you were like forty two. Which for a strong yeah. man realizing that he's that light would have been even made, just made it even worse. It made us like, it you know, does, yeah, yeah. <laughs> crushing, crushing. So you know, I'd lost my my passion for life. I lost my career because I I wasn't competing mm -hmm. strong man. I was so beat up. I didn't you know I didn't want to do it. And then, uh, you know, within a few months of just being totally off my rocker, uh, I'd driven friends away. I had driven family away. And, uh, you know, just one thing after another, one loss after another loss after, you know, things being taken away from you. And then it got to the point where I was losing my house. So you talk about this downward spiral, you know, just negativity all the time. And it, Every time I turned around, I, I caught myself thinking, you know, I've lost this, I've lost lost my house, I lost my wife, I lost my son, I lost my, my career, I lost blah, 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 lost, lost, lost. And I'm focusing on the negative. And uh, it wasn't until a few years into it, uh, this had been late summer, maybe, maybe fall of 2015. So several years of being lost in this drug-induced haze. Um, I finally got to a point where I would say this was my rock bottom. You never realize it at the time, but I was sitting in my house. My house was kind of a mess. Not kind of. It was a mess. It was a tweaker home. Um, shit everywhere, and, you know, it just wasn't clean. And and I'm looking around. I'm miserable, and it was another time. Um, so I, all through those few years, I was calling my son all the time. And then gradually it was they would answer every other day, and then it would – turn into three days apart and I wouldn't be able to talk to them. And then turn into like once a week that they would answer the phone. Um, and so this was a time where I had called and it was another time I'd reached the voicemail and I voicemail. God, that, that sweet English woman on their voicemail was just awful. It was like a little knife sticking in your heart every time. Cause it's just another time I don't get to talk to my son. And so I got really down. I was really depressed. I started thinking, you know, I can't talk to my son. You know, I, I'm going through this negative spiral of I've lost this, I've lost that. 
I, I don't want to be here anymore, man. I can't take this. I was just broken. I was broken. And I was thinking about ending it. And I was pretty serious about it because you know, it wasn't the first time I'd thought about it. Uh, I had this uh, 40 caliber with hollow points. It had a little um, rubber ball in the middle of the hollow point. So it like goes in and it penetrates deeper and spreads and makes a big freaking mess. So I was going to use that. I had... Uh, I had the gun in my mouth. It's such a shitty thing to talk about, but you know, you got to relive it a little bit each time you tell the story, brother. So just so you know, brother, you're hey, you're doing it. What, what I know this is tough, and you're, but this is a people that are hearing this that have gone through this. They need to hear this, brother. So you're, you're being your character I is that. unbelievably <laughs> strong right now because you're recanting a pretty, pretty tough time in your life. So. We're very appreciative of you yeah. doing what you're doing. <laughs> I appreciate you saying that. You know, um, so I was about to, to end it. I was right there on the verge, and uh, this little thought popped into my head, and I thought, what, what about the poor bastard that's going to have to clean up this mess? <laughs> yeah. And my sick sense of humor was like, that's funny. <laughs> that's, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> you truly, you actually found humor in that. Well, there was yeah, a little man, hope there. You had a little sense little of humor. Lining. There's a spark of hope. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I find and it. I, that, I, I find it interesting that that was the one time you decided to listen to the little voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was kind of it was forced, man. Brother. That's exactly what it yeah. was. It was. Yeah. I think it was. Uh, the voice found a way to talk to me rather than just throwing up red flags. It was yeah. humor. And he yeah, kind of, yeah. he got in under the radar. Got it. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. figured out a way to do it. <laughs> way to help you out. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly it, man. You know, it got me at the right moment. Cause I, I mm -hmm. thought that's, if I'm laughing at this, I can't be ready that ready to go. So I yeah, yeah, put yeah, the yeah. gun down and I thought, and then it hit me like what had just happened. And mm -hmm. that realization of, oh, my God, what the fuck are you doing, man? Like, mm -hmm. what the hell is going on? Um, that kind of swept over me. And I kind of started breaking down a little bit. And I thought, mm -hmm. God damn, you know, I'm surrounded by so much bad. Like, I got to find something good to live for, you know. Mm -hmm. And it, it, <clears throat> So I started thinking, you know, I'm, I, I go over, okay, let's find something good. Let's look around. Maybe there's something here worth living for. And I start saying, oh, man, you know, my house is trashed. You know, I'm, I'm addicted to fucking a new drug. It's even worse than the old one. And I lost my family. I lost my friends. I lost my career. I lost it. And, and, and then I go, wait, wait, wait. You're doing that fucking negative list again. I lost, I lost, I lost. And I thought, I've got to find something positive. Let's find something. Yes. And, yes. uh, it takes me a minute. I'm looking around. I'm trying to find something. I'm, I mean, my house was trashed. I'm sitting on the side of a bathtub in my bathroom, and the bathtub doesn't have a front panel on it because I had sold it. Oh, oh tweaker shit, man. Oh, shit. Tweaker shit. Yeah, you were, when, you said, when you said tweaker house, you were fucking, you were fucking around selling fucking shit. Tweaker shit, man. Yeah, <laughs> I sold the panel off the front of my bathtub. <laughs> Oh, so my God. I put my head in my hands. I'm like, God, what am I going to do? And then I see I see my feet just sitting there on the floor, kind of wiggling around a little bit. And they were kind of messed up because I had been shooting meth for shit, you know, most of that time. I, I went straight to it almost. Um, went from smoking to shooting in a matter of maybe a month. Oh. And... Uh, you know, because it's all about efficiency, and that was just quicker and easier in my mind. Well, so you're when you're looking at your feet, when you're looking at your feet, so, you were you were doing it to your feet. Is that what you're saying? Well, no, no. But what happens with uh, with meth is it, it just kind of settles down in your feet, and it, it just causes blisters and you know dried oh, really? skin and cracked skin. You really? looks like shit. Yeah, it, for me anyway, it looked really? like shit. And so I'm thinking, God damn. Well, at least you know what. They may be messed up, and they're pretty messed up, <laughs> but I can get the fuck up, and I can walk out of this goddamn hellhole right now. I don't have to be here. Yes. And right then, I'm like, yes. oh, God, right here, the pit of my stomach, this little surge of joy comes up into my heart and, like, warms my chest. Went, Whoa, yes. what the 
fuck was that, man? Like, I haven't felt happiness in years. And that, that was so powerful, so freaking powerful. I just sat with it for a while. I'm like, all it took was just realizing I got my own two feet. I, I, mm -hmm. I could be free if I needed to be. Yes, brother. So yes. I, I, I went to bed. I got up I'm the next day. I'm getting fucking goose like, pimples. I'm covered in <laughs> goose pimples right now. I'm not shitting you, brother. This is fucking powerful. This is fucking, powerful story. This is fucking powerful shit. Look at that, dick. Jesus yeah. Christ. Look at that. that, 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 chick, that, that very powerful story, all man. over me. Oh, my very God. Very powerful story. That's <laughs> fuck, man. I'm like cold all awesome. of a sudden. Fuck. That's a lot of chicken skin, too, man. Jesus <laughs> <laughs> it's a big arm. Uh, brother, I mean, that little turn, that little, that little moment you described, that's gonna that's gonna save many lives. I can feel it right now. Yeah. You know, it saved my life, and it taught me that, and it taught me a really important lesson about gratitude and how simple gratitude can be. Mm -hmm. You find the littlest thing and hold on to that gratitude because the next day when I got up, I wanted that feeling again. So first time in my life, I'm motivated to find good in my life mm -hmm. rather than see it for all the negatives. So. I look around and I think, you know, let's keep it simple, Travis. My hands. I got my feet. I got my hands. With these hands, I'm still strong. I can go anywhere and I can do anything. And those and are big fucking surge. strong hands, man. Those yeah. are a pair of big fucking meat bucks, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but I got that feeling again. And so yes. I, I, I went with it, man. And the next day I yes. went for a third thing. On the fourth day I went for a fourth thing. And here's when I learned something pretty crucial. On the fifth day, I couldn't find a new thing to be grateful for. So I went through my previous four, and I thought about those. Now I got a gratitude list. Now, instead of making a list of every negative thing in my life and spiraling downwards, I'm starting to make a list of all the good shit in my life, and I'm reversing that momentum. Now I'm going up. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that, that yes, was the changing brother. point. It was all that. And now, things didn't change overnight. You know, I was still addicted very much addicted but uh <clears throat> you know i had been uh, addicted to cigarettes for a little while because i'd smoked for a few years during this time too um so I, I figured out a little trick to kill that addiction because i thought cigarette this is just stupid smoking cigarettes it's the last thing i need is just more shit on top so let's get rid of this so i i i thought about i don't know why it came to me but i thought about uh that movie, A Clockwork Orange. Remember the old Stanley Kubrick movie? Yeah, where, uh, yes, yeah. Ultra violent it. kid. And uh, they take him and they tape his eyes open and give him an injection that makes him feel like sick and then force feed all this violent movie movies to him. Make him watch all these violent scenes and then he's feeling sick and wanting to throw up during it. So when he gets out of the hospital, he can't stand violence. As soon as violent things start happening, he <laughs> breaks down and starts throwing up. So I thought, There's yeah, baby. Yeah, yeah, baby. <laughs> Every time I would light a cigarette, I would imagine it like suffocating me. Like I can't breathe and feeling sick, and I would like gag and make myself almost puke. And so it was such a miserable experience. Every time that I'd light up, that finally I got to a point where I was about to light, and I'm like. Get the hell away from me. I can't stand this thing. I'm already feeling stuffy and suffocated. And, and uh, that one worked a little too well. If somebody smokes near me now, I start feeling like shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I thought, you know what? If it could work for that, it can work for the meth as well. So at that point, um, and, and you know, this was, this had actually, that part had happened before the uh, the lowest point in my life. This was actually earlier in 2015 when I figured this out. Um, <clears throat> when I would shoot up, I imagined it burning my arm. And it didn't take long before me, before I started feeling actual pain and I stopped shooting up. Um, so I had pretty much stopped shooting up. I think I had actually stopped maybe a few weeks before that, that lowest point um you know long enough that i still had fucked up feet but i wasn't shooting it <laughs> um but uh i was still smoking it so every time i would smoke it i would try to do that same thing i feel suffocated i try to make myself gag and feel sick and i said i hate this i hate this 
every time I'd light it, I'd say, I hate this. I'm a slave to this shit. I'm fucking miserable. I hate it. And then just gradually, it took a lot longer to get rid of that one. Um, obviously, it's a little more powerful addiction. Um, but I carried that, you know, and, and with the new momentum of finding all this positivity in my life, spinning things for the better, um, that, that was a pretty powerful tool because now, now I'm armed with, you know, positive emotion and, and confidence. Yes. And it made <clears throat> trying to get rid of this, get over this addiction, it gave me a little more, you know, ammunition, I guess, so to speak. Um, so that was, uh, that was mid-2015 when I had that breakdown, and it was only a month later that I was kicked out of my house. That was one of the things that caused the breakdown. You know, I was losing my house. And so it was a month later that I got kicked out of my house, um, like September of 2015. Um, a lot of people think that was the rock bottom, but, you know, I, I know the rock bottom was that moment on the bathtub. <laughs> Yeah, sure. what actually happened when I was kicked out of my house was because I had this new way of thinking, finding the good and everything, I mm -hmm. thought I can turn this into a good situation. So I knew it was coming. I knew it, you know, I had limited time. I was packing my stuff and trying to get into a storage unit. Um, I started just putting all the bad energy in the house. I said, this is my prison. This is my prison. I can't escape this prison. I know I can't because I, I just can't get out of here. I can't make myself leave. So I know I'm going to be forced out. So this is my hell. When I can get free of here, things are going to change. My life is going to be better. I know it's going to be better. And then sure enough, they came, you know, a couple months later, kicked me out. And, uh, you know, when, when you're evicted from your home, they, uh, they take all your stuff and then ransom it back to you. <laughs> or they auction it off. Um, ransom it back to you. Oh, my God. It, it, yeah, otherwise they auction it off. So, um, you know, I had to pay the money to get my own stuff back. And, and during that time, I was, you know, packing things away in the storage unit. And this storage unit is the one that we actually had trained at. Nick, you'd seen it. You'd been there. Yeah, I've been um, there. Yeah. That was, we trained there, strongman, for 12 years, 13 years. So I knew the owners pretty well. And, uh, you know, the first night that I was evicted, I had nowhere to go. And so I went to the storage unit and I, I had some stuff in the bed of my truck. So I started putting it away and I just, I didn't know what to do, where to go. So I just stayed there in that parking lot. Uh, and I ended up staying there the whole night. And uh, I was kind of working on stuff, but I took a nap. Uh, the next morning, uh, Steve, it, it's Steve and Linda are the owners, and mm -hmm. Steve came over to me in this, you know, southeast Texas accent. Travis, you know you can't stay here, right? <laughs> 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 oh, of course. Yeah, man. Yeah, I, I, I have no intention of staying here. So I'm sorry. Uh, I was working late, whatever. Um, but it just, I kept staying there. I kept working late and, and they just turned a blind eye to it. And uh, I ended up living in that storage unit for a couple months. Um, I slept on like a two and a half foot by three foot uh, plyo storage bars, a plyo box, but I had a little storage underneath it. I slept on top of that. I put a yoga mat down for some uh, cushion. And then uh, I had my feet up on a shelf that I had built. <laughs> so, quick question, Rob. This is this is the <clears throat> where you're talking about. This is where the unit, where your original yeah. training place was, correct? So, so in That's essence, exactly you, built, you built your strongman career at this place, and now you're back rebuilding your life at this place. This is oh, like fucking. This is this is like point. fucking. I'm getting a little <laughs> chicken skin. God damn it! This is like crazy <laughs> stuff, brother. You know, lining all this stuff up is. It's almost like it was all meant to be, brother. You know, it, it, I almost, think it was, man. Almost like he went back to his roots. Yeah, it's yeah, kind of exactly. yeah. Had to had to just, just chop it down and regrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, made history in this process too. Yeah, I mean, keep in mind we're we're just climbing out of the bottom. This story goes all the way back to the top, so we're just we're at the we're at the fun part of the climb right now. So yeah, we had the yeah. Yeah. that's it. Keep going, brother. Keep going. All right, so. uh so I was there for a couple months. I was still addicted. 
still using meth. I was smoking it. You know, I would, I would close the door and then I was really quiet when I would stay in my little room and I'd smoke and, you know, try to hide out. And, um, you know, I had one light, I had one power strip. I ran a extension cord over to an outlet and, uh, you know, I had a, a light and I had a little, uh, charger for my phone and, and, uh, <laughs> It was pretty rugged. It was pretty rough. I had a cooler that I would have to change the ice out. And I could keep a little bit of food in there. Um, but, uh, you know, after a couple months of being there, um, after a few weeks of being there, I had saved enough money. I could have gone to a hotel. But at this point, um, earlier in the year 2015, I had gotten a call from my parents who two years earlier had moved to Reno, Nevada. Um, and I'm still living in Houston, Texas at this time. Um, the call was, you know, your mom is sick. You should probably come out here and, and see her. She's really sick. She, uh, she had been diagnosed with liver failure. Um, and she was, she was pretty sick. Um, you know, I, I, at that time I was like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm about to lose the house. That'd be good. Maybe, maybe y'all could send me a few hundred bucks and help me out so I can get out of here. Nah, that, that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so I had to, I had a little side business that I was doing and I had to save up money. Now the side business, you know, I wasn't one of those guys that uh, would go out and steal and then pawn something and, and get drug money. I was, I was industrious. I've always been industrious. So I would drive around on trash night and I would find things that I could fix up and restore or just straight up sell. I had a little, uh, shop on uh, on uh, like let go or one of those apps and I had, a, I had a fair amount of customers that came to me pretty regularly for shit you know tools all the way to furniture <laughs> clean stuff up and make it look good and sell it off um, literally, obviously it wasn't a great rebuilding, living rebuilding your life literally as we speak I mean you're rebuilding yeah. furniture rebuilding your life all in one swipe brother this is that's, that's what shit. it was, bro. <laughs> shit, bro. So I'd saved up almost enough money. Um, I was ready to leave. I had one thing that I had to do before I could go. See, I, I used to drive a 2003 Dodge Dakota, and I can look out over there. It's still in the parking lot. I've still got it because I love this truck. But that truck, those the Dodges in that year, all got burned paint jobs. They had a shitty paint job that just burned up in the sun. So I went about uh, trying to do the paint job myself. Now, in true tweaker fashion, you know, this was a couple of years, 2014 or so. <laughs> true tweaker fashion, I stripped it down. And then I got about halfway through finishing it before I got sidetracked and went on to something else. So I had this truck that had two different colors of primer on it for like a year <laughs> <laughs> it looked like shit and it was in my mind it was kind of a symbol of shame you know it was like i need to finish something because you yeah. know as a tweaker you get wrapped up in doing so many things and so many things sound cool i want to do this i want to do that and you just never finish a goddamn project you got 30 things going and none of them ever get done so i had to get that project finished so I worked on it for a few days. I, I sanded it down, made it smooth, and then I, I got a, a paint spray, just an outdoor sprayer. Um, <laughs> but I made the mistake of using high gloss paint. So I sprayed it oh, no. and I finished it. Oh, no. And then this is this is a, a beat up truck, uh, you know. I, I used scrap metal and all kinds of shit in this thing. It was dented and scratched, and and uh, with high gloss paint, you see every Everything. single imperfection. <laughs> Uh, so I, I kind of sanded it back down a little bit, and I used a, a lower, uh, like a flat black, kind of mixed with some gloss, um, and it actually came out really good. It looked pretty freaking good for a, uh, you know, a home paint job. <laughs> Dude, again, it's um, just like, it's like symbolic of you rebuilding your life, you know, with the gloss that's on it. That's what it was. See all the shit. Okay, we got we to take it back to the metal and start again, man. You're, uh, it, it's like your behavior patterns of your life had turned into rebuilding your life. This is fucking, this is like really inspiring <laughs> shit here. Yeah. Very That's symbolic, exactly it, you know. Man. Well, it, uh, 
so by the time I was about done, it was it was over the Christmas weekend, um, 24th and 25th. Um, I actually celebrated Christmas with uh, the, the people who owned the unit um, or the storage unit. Sorry, I always call it the unit because that's what we called it when we trained there. So, yeah. Not a clever name, but a cool name. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's cool. A little clever. So give yourself some credit. Give yeah. yourself some credit. Yeah, I just, you know? <laughs> Um, so I celebrated with Lyndon and Steve and I got to know some of their family. Eight, uh, I, <laughs> Linda had made this chili. Now here's the funny little side story. Linda had made this chili and she bragged. She's like, it's just as hot going out as it is coming in. So it's like, oh, whatever. Sure. Sure. <laughs> and I ate, it was, it was the first real meal I'd had in months. Cause I was eating like fast food once every day, sometimes every other day, it was just garbage food that I'd been eating. So this is a real meal. And I mean, I picked out, it was so good. It was so freaking good. And, uh, the next day, uh, I think this would have been Christmas day. I realized she wasn't lying. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> so I, oh, I made, no. I made oh, it up to the office, but the office was only open for a couple hours on Christmas Day. So I made it to the office. I got to use the bathroom inside. And I think I'm in the clear, and I'm walking back to my unit. It's in the back. And about halfway back, oh, no. the rumbling starts again. I'm like, oh, oh shit. <laughs> I go up to the office. I knock on the door. He's not answering because they live upstairs oh. in, the, in the back. So they couldn't hear me knocking. Oh. And I'm like, God damn it. What am I going to do? You know, there's cameras all over this place. I can't just squat in the yard. That's, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. So they're overlooking. You stay in there. You got a crap in there. In there in exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I get into my unit and I shut the door and I put a little tr uh, plastic grocery bag inside a little trash can that I had up on the shelf. And I, oh, I set the can. There wasn't much room for me to do anything. So I had the can on that, that box that I was sleeping on. But I only had room for one of my feet. And I had I had to put my other oh, foot fuck. down on the ground. So I'm sitting here oh, kind of halfway squat, halfway standing. <laughs> And it was it was it was fucking uncomfortable, man. It was uncomfortable and it was awful. Oh God! Uh, but yeah, it worked. It worked. I, I didn't make a mess anywhere. I took that bag. I threw it way back in the dumpster. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother, this, this is also symbolic of what you're you're having to go through. You had to literally purge. climb through the shit. You had to purge the shit, climb through the shit to get back. I mean, everything you're describing. I mean, I, I have to was, imagine man. plenty of people have gone through addiction and had some level that they. You said so many things that people can relate to, brother. So again. Mm -hmm. My hat is off. Your, your character is very strong for being able to recant all this, and we thank you very much. So, you know, keep, 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 that. keep rocking, brother. This is um, inspiring stuff. So, you know, after after Christmas Day um, <laughs> and that whole fiasco there, uh, um, the paint had dried on my truck, and it was now mm -hmm. December 26, 2015. And... Uh, I decided I was ready to go. I had my truck packed up. I had everything I could fit in there. I put in my truck and I put a tarp over it and locked it all down. It was about 700 pounds of stuff. And, and I say that because it becomes important kind of later in the story. Um, but I took off on the 26th and I, I started driving to Reno. Um, the important thing, you know, with taking off and leaving the situation I was in was I burned all my connections at this point and I was going to a place where I wasn't going to have any connections. So I had a little bit of math left. I had just a small supply and I was going to make sure that, uh, that was it. So I had to dole it out. I had to kind of really watch what I was doing and then taper off as much as I could. Um, and I took 10 days to do it on this drive. I started out, and I would drive when I wanted to drive. I'd sleep when I wanted to sleep. I went wherever I wanted to. Um, you know, and, and for the first time in my life, I drove through snow. And can't believe that I didn't fly off the side of the road because it's a two-wheel drive pickup truck. 
but I think oh, all that yeah. weight in the back is what saved yeah. my life. So things yeah, just yeah. things just happened to work out for me because yeah. I was finally yeah. on the right path. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mess, yeah. I, you know, but um, New Year's Eve, I came into uh, Grand Canyon National Park. And, uh, you know, I'd been there as a kid. It had been shit, probably 25 years since I had been there. So I wanted to see it again, you know, with new eyes, I guess, so to speak. So I drive into the park. It's about midnight. There's nobody there. I'm driving around. Can't see shit. There's snow everywhere. A family of mule deer run out in front of me. And I think one of them sat on the front of my truck because I, I tried to hit the brakes, but I slid into it. And it just sat on the front of my truck. I swear it was as big as my truck. You know, it was a freaking monster. I was gonna say, for, for, for people that don't know, mule deer is like five times the size of a normal deer, correct? Yeah, they're big. They're like a freaking horse with antlers. You know, wow. they're, they're big. They're huge. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I decided I'm going to pull over. I'm going to take a nap, and I'm going to you know drive around the next day. So I, I turn into this little alcove, and I... Uh, just park in a spot. I have no idea. I know the canyon's in front of me because I can hear it. You can hear that vast openness. Um, but it's so deep, you can't see the bottom anywhere. I had a flashlight that was supposed to work for like 300 yards, and I still couldn't find the bottom of this thing. Um, so I took a nap, and you talk about rebirth. The next morning, I woke up with the sun coming up over the rim of the canyon right in front of me, right in front of me. I mean, it was like I parked perfectly, sunrise over the Grand Canyon, New Year's Day, 2016. <laughs> Damn. Perfect, man. It was awesome. Uh, that, I'll never forget that moment. Um, you know, and then I, I spent some time there. I spent some time at uh, Zion, and that has become one of my favorite places. Zion's beautiful. Um, and then I rolled into uh, Houston, or reno on uh january 7th uh sorry january 5th january 5th 2016 10 days of driving and i had tapered off and tapered off and tapered off and i was done by the time i got into reno i was the meth was gone i had no plans to get more and uh you know one of the things that i should note um when you try to get off meth, because I tried to kick that habit a couple times, you get a depression that is unlike any other. It is soul crushing. You have no energy, no drive, because your dopamine is gone. And uh, I didn't have the option to crash. I didn't have the option to stop. I didn't have the option to feel bad or sorry for myself or slow down. I was on the road in the middle of nowhere. It was me and only me. And mm. so I think that was important. Um, for yeah, somebody yeah. trying to kick an addiction, <clears throat> that, that's one of the steps I think you got to do is you got to find something that that keeps you going. That you cannot, you can't just stop. You can't. You got to get up and do something the next day. You got to get up and move forward. Um, yeah. Because yeah. I I didn't have the option to quit. I just kept going. I never felt bad. I never. I was so excited to see these places that. I never felt that crash. It was just kind of easing myself off of it. And uh, when I got to Reno, I was good to go. You know, I had a couple times where I was kind of thinking, you know, I, right now would be a good time to fucking get high because, you know, shit sucks. <laughs> things, things weren't easy with my parents when I first got there. They were okay. They were okay, but there was definitely a little bit of, uh, yeah, I guess, hesitation to just, allow me back into their lives and i felt the same way i didn't want to just allow them back because i felt you know abandoned in a way because you know, everybody yeah. had ditched me at the same time so i had i had a lot of animosity and i'm sure they had theirs and you know <clears throat> over time though um that went away uh, a few about a month later uh, my mom had one of her big episodes where she ended up in the hospital for a couple weeks uh, because of the liver failure um, oh, man. <clears throat> she, uh, yeah, she got real sick and we, uh, my dad had to work. He was working in Tahoe, which is like an hour away. So he had a long drive five days a week and it was up to me to go see my mom and take care of her. And, you know, I was helping around the house. I was trying to make food for my dad. 
And I think the point at which it was uh, it was good between me and my parents was my dad coming home after work, and you know, I think I'd made spaghetti or some shit, <laughs> just something easy. And he goes, "Man, you know what? I'm really glad that you're here." And I, oh, that kind of caught me. It was like, "Yeah, <laughs> that must have been a moment, brother." You know, it was. Uh, you know, it, it meant a lot to me. You know, because it meant that uh, you know, I'd been helping out with my mom, and I, he was, he, he was truly happy. He was grateful that I was there. Ooh, and he yeah, seemed now right. that I had changed as a person. And, exactly. uh, yeah. And he's I mean, I think, you. you know, on that note, what's that? And he's proud of you. Yeah. He's proud of you coming out of it. You know, he, he's he, happy getting to see it. He probably he never quite said that, but you're probably right. Well, you, let me, let me interject real quick, right. brother. I would, when, when we traveled a lot together, your dad was almost always there. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, you remember Nick, oh, yeah. and I can remember so many times where I would be bullshitting with with your dad, and <laughs> we'd be talking, and you know, we're always having a lot of fun. He's a great, he's just always full of laugh. But I got to tell you, he was so proud of you. Yeah, I mean, it was like for you to be doing what you were doing, and him to be there with you. He was living beyond his dreams. So let me tell you, from the outside looking in, brother. Your dad, he loves you, never stop loving you, your biggest fan. Um, so I know it's always different to hear from an outside, outside source coming in. But, you know, <clears throat> your dad, even because, I mean, I thought I went to see your dad not too long ago. You know, your your dad is, he there. there's not an ounce of you that he's never not loved. He just yeah. had to step back and let you figure out your shit. Because I actually saw him. Yeah. I don't think I ever told you this. I saw him. When he was in Reno and you were still in Texas, and we had yeah, a brief conversation, right. he just he just said, you know, he's he's getting his stuff worked out. You know, he needs to do it on his own, and he knew it was the best thing. Is look at the way everything turned out. But I just I just wanted to tell you that I don't know if I've ever told you. Might as well do it now on a live show. <laughs> 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 I'm telling you, brother, your, your dad, your dad. I mean, I I was I was like. I'll be honest. I was jealous. I was jealous that you that you know your your dad looked at you that way because it was it was intense and it was it was it, jealous in a good way. Please, I, yeah. you know I love you. We've yeah. known each other yeah. a long time. We're tight, but I just want you to understand, uh, you know, the feel the the emotion and the feeling that comes out of your dad when we talked about you was it was so strong and over the top. Man, that's that's pretty cool to hear. I, think, same, you know, similar, I feel the same way. Yeah. I mean, I Roger's amazing. Roger's I mean, great. I didn't have that from my dad. Whenever. I didn't have that either. That's why I said well, I was yeah, jealous. It was, it was you know, really cool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, I mean, shit. He was there with you. I mean, shit. He traveled internationally with you. You know. Yeah. I yeah, remember. A times did, yeah, I remember yeah. sitting. I remember sitting among them, sitting next to him on the bus. You know, <laughs> going to going to competition. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so. Anyway, but yeah, back to your story. So your dad gives you that moment that really kind of cements the fact that hey, we're back. That's where you left off. Sorry to interrupt, brother. Yeah, no, that was know that. that's that's just kind of how it felt. Was you know, you, you know when you're fucking up. You know when you're destroying shit. You know everybody. Some people are really good at denying it. Some people are really good at saying it's not me. It's the world. Um. Thankfully, I'm not one of those people. I'm pretty real with myself. But even those people, deep down, they know when they're the problem. And uh, yeah. to know that you're the problem, that you're the source of all trouble, especially when it comes to, like, relationship with my dad. Because, you know, like you say, he was my best friend. We trained together oh. for 10 years all the time, every weekend, you know, a couple times during the week usually. And he came to contests, so... He taught Nick how to do Atlas stones. <laughs> he did. Yeah, sure did. And there quite a few other things too. I learned a lot from you, Dad. Yeah, he uh, he was. It was good to be back. You know, friends with my dad. Um, yeah, I, bet. I think at that point, at that point, I had changed considerably. You know, I, I literally had walked through hell and. Uh, 
I'd walked through hell and I, I came face to face with the devil and he was asking me if I was ready to give up and I told him I'm not finished yet. And that was kind that's of that it. turning point, you know, and uh, that's it. That uh, that'll change you as a person when you realize that you have that strength. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> I guess, you know, I carry that with me now, but yeah, that's uh, that was that was a fun time to come back. It was it was an emotional time. It was uh, it was also when I finally started training again. Now, yes, during the uh, during the, the meth addiction, I I trained very very little. I trained at the very beginning because that was just my habit, and uh, <clears throat> I got to a point, you know, I I didn't work out for four years. Basically, I went to the gym maybe a handful of times that first year, but the, the remaining half of the first year and three years after that, I couldn't stand training, so I never went. Um, and you guys knew me at my heaviest. I was 340 pounds at my heaviest. Yeah. Yep. Um, Cock strong, so, baby. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, um, I mean, so people don't realize is you were third at the Arnold, what, three times? And twice and then and I was third twice and then fourth that year 2011 yeah. with a still broken ankle. And, yeah. and no so, mistake about it, you were you were at the top of the international house. You know, you were a top player in the international yeah. circuit. There's no question about that. Can't be argued. That's not up for debate. Yeah, you know, you know, fifth place at worlds three different yeah. times. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. And, you know, and um, starting to train for the first time again after four years must have been kind of well, an interesting it was, step back it, it into was, it. It, it. You know, when you talk about all these pieces that fall into place and like fate almost driving it, um, yeah. I remember at one point during that whole the hell, and I was just thinking to myself, when is this going to be over? When is this nightmare going to be done? This is awful. <laughs> you know, um, that little voice. He popped up and he says, you're going to start over. It was just so quick and so small. And it just, you're going to start over. And I'm like, I knew exactly what that meant. I knew that I was going to start over. Everything I'd done was strong and I was going to lose. I was going to have to rebuild. Now, when I did my very first contest in 2002, I weighed 227 pounds. I could have gone in the lightweight division. I, went, I chose to go with the heavyweights and I never... I've never regretted that decision, but 227 pounds. The day that I walked into the gym for the first time, I was 227 pounds. Oh, God. <laughs> oh my God, brother. It's like, it's like, it's like, you're just, it's like life is just reloading with this wisdom so that when you get back in the same spot, you won't make some mistakes. It's unbelievable. That's, the story. That's this story is like, I, I got to tell you, all of you listeners, if this story doesn't help you with some sort of problem you're having, uh, you need to rewind and listen to this story again because you're missing something. Because I don't know how we could have a more inspiring story going than we do right now. Look at all these things that have lined up. This is crazy, brother. <laughs> it was it was kind of a wild trip, you know, but uh, I remember my first workout. I did 50-pound dumbbells for seven on incline bench, and I, that was it. That was all I had. I was, I was weak as a kitten. Uh, <laughs> as a kid. A couple days later, I came in. I did 405 deadlift for three reps. I went home, and I thought I had broken my back. I was like, what the fuck no. did I do? Oh, my, I can't move. I'm stiff as hell. It's 405. This is 40% of my max. What the hell? How am I going to ever get back to the top? Because I still had this idea I was going to climb back up. And, you know, that little mountain in front of me just got a whole lot higher. But <laughs> this sucks. Um, yeah, but slowly, slowly but surely, I just kept climbing, kept working, kept putting in the work. I tried to remember to enjoy the process mm -hmm. rather than yes. expect too much. But true to uh, Travis fashion, um, I got a little crazy a couple of times, and I started thinking where I should be rather than where I was, and I started pushing weights too hard. And after about a year, um, I got to a point where I was training really hard, and then I had a slew of injuries. I had like eight different injuries in the course of about three or four weeks. I tore my pec twice, just a little oh. rip and then a bigger rip because I didn't freaking take time to, to fix it. 
uh, I hurt my shoulder. I tore my hamstring. I tore my other hamstring. And I, I tore a little chunk of my bicep doing stones. Like, holy shit. Now, now, what the hell am I going to do? How how can I do this? I'm falling apart. <laughs> so, uh. I actually went to a friend of mine, a guy named Dustin Speed. He's a really good powerlifting coach and strong dude. And I think, John, you've met him at some point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, he was kind of your first coach coming back in. That's right. That's right. And that was the yeah. first time I'd ever had an actual coach. And he, you know, he helped me a lot with uh, figuring out my programming and putting some sanity into my programming. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> which, which, because the, because remember too, when you were, when you were going, like you were going at 25, 25 is different than where you are now. You're what you were, what 35 at this point. Um, yeah, 30. Roughly. Yeah. I think I was about 35. Yeah. Yeah. So to, and, and, you know, a, a decade of difference is a big with your body like that, you know? Exactly. I, I had two things going against me. I had the, the crazy mentality of, you know, berserker mode. And then I had expectations <laughs> where I should. Be. Yeah. So I thought weights that I've done before is what I should be able yeah. to do now. And I'm looking yeah. at guys that are competing like, well, they're pulling this much. I need to be pulling more. And that just led me to putting weights and weight on the bar way too frequently. Um, yeah. But so it was, it took me about two years of, uh, I started training in January of 2016. I did my first contest in October of 2017. It was America's Strongest Man. And it was a heavy, heavy freaking show. They had an 1,100-pound yoke, um, a press medley. They had a 250 dumbbell, a 400 axle, and a 400 log, 800-pound deadlift for reps. Because <laughs> after, after this whole you started coming back, we crossed paths again. I was announcing uh, at uh, one of Oates' contests at the Fit Expo. That was yeah. what was your it, second contest after America's That was your second right? one. Yep, and you it was tore about your hamstring uh, in that three one months too, later. Did? You yeah. tore your hamstring in that show too, did you? <laughs> yep, yep. Doing that fucking moss wrestling. I went against a guy who was you know, 40 pounds heavier than me. And he trained with Martins Lysis, who was at that time the moss world yeah. champion. So. I, I just got thrown into the lion's den and he did this little, you know, load me up on one side and then this alligator death roll and pulled me onto one leg and <laughs> Pow, <laughs> they cut my the hamstring. Handy. Yeah, exactly. And that, that show was 12 freaking events. That was I the third that. event in that I did that. I that had to compete brutal. through the rest of that fucking contest with my hamstring swelling up. Like <laughs> I hate this shit. God damn it. <laughs> so yeah yeah that was uh, thanks memory. for the memory john <laughs> <laughs> well i remember i was so glad to see you there because we hadn't talked in a handful of years you know because when you went through that low phase we had texted a few times you know i remember we had texted just a few times and it was somewhere in the midst of that and uh you know but then all of a sudden, I, I show up to do some announcing, and also I look across the way, and there you're there. I was like, "Oh my God, this is great!" You know, to see you again and and see that you were back doing your thing, and it was so great to see. Yeah, that that. Sorry light, about that, guys. That's okay. That light was getting bright. <laughs> there we now, go. It's coming through. I can't even put the That's damn perfect. screen on. Well, that that yeah. big that big that big meat hook of yours is doing the job perfectly. <laughs> Your portable window shit is working well. So you're you're yeah, back exactly. in the action. You're you're climbing your way back. <clears throat> Obviously, um, you know you had a handful of years, but you know let's let's get to the high five moment, brother. You you basically got back to the top. You know, it took it took several years, and uh, you know, busting my ass in, in Champions League and in some of the American shows. Um, but yeah, and you uh, started paying a lot of attention to what you were eating, which made a big difference in your development, your recovery too. Well, you know, that's when uh, it was what twenty. It was later on in the year after I had seen you. Yeah, uh, we did a seminar, and you came down and did some uh, talking at the seminar. Yeah, and then I decided I needed, you know, a coach who knew more about strongman and what I needed to do next. And that's when we started working together. Yeah, because yeah, so. I remember, I remember at the at the Fit Expo, 
I remember you walking in with a goddamn Subway sandwich, and I said, God damn it, he's going to get back where he wants to go. We're going to have to get some steak in his hands and get the, get the Subway out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that was probably, you know, the second biggest turning point in my, my coming back. You know, one was Dustin helping me. Two was now, you know, taking on – your diet program, and then, you know, the knowledge that you've got, it just increased, expanded my foundation. Yeah. Um, I started competing, uh, started competing better, started winning shows. Uh, and then 2019 happened, I ripped my shoulder and uh, had to rehab that, but I stayed on that diet. And I think it was probably the most successful rehab that surgeon has ever had. Uh, because I talk to him all the time. Uh, his yeah, name you bounced Dr. out Webster. of it quick, dude. You bounced back so fast, it was yeah. unbelievable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know, part of a little, I had a little bit of help from uh, COVID because 2019 took. I was 2019 was out for sure. I had I had to take the uh, super spinatus, which had just ripped clean off the bone. They had to anchor that down with four anchors drilled into the bones and and sutures going through the tendon um and it took a little while to rebuild that but you know i got full range of motion in that arm and it's probably the best feeling joint i've got in my entire body to be honest <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, so that's I, something to be I, said I, for proper that. rehab man <laughs> but uh yeah i mean 2020 i would have i probably would have started competing a little before i was ready to um, yeah, but nothing was around, so I had to wait. Everything until, happened for a reason. Your comeback, brother. Every even it, COVID it was in the really, right spot. It, <laughs> it really did, man. It's unbelievable. <laughs> you know, when you start looking at the world and finding all the good and looking for silver linings, everything yeah. manages to just fall into place. It's just it's like magic, but create yeah. the magic. I swear to God. <laughs> um, so I started competing at the end of 2012, or 2020, sorry. Um, and a few months later, I got the call, you know, the invite for World's Strongest Man. He said, yeah, uh, Colin Bryce <laughs> shot me a message, said, hey, you know, if uh, if you think you're ready, we'd love to have you. It's like, God damn right I'm ready. Even if I'm not ready, I'm going to be fucking ready. <laughs> well, and at, at that point, you'd been you'd pretty much been mowing down the Champions League contest. You had just been winning those things, and you're at the top. Yeah. You were, you, I mean, you'd proved yourself in your comeback. You just needed an, an opportunity, you know? Yeah, exactly, exactly. I was Champions League. I was always on the podium um, or winning the show. So I <clears throat> did pretty well, proved that I was ready for it. And yeah. then uh, it was about two months out from World's Strongest Man when I got the invite. And uh, <laughs> true to old school Travis form, I, I tried to cram the 10 years that I'd been away from World's Strongest Man <laughs> into two months of training. And I freaking went full on. And I was like, I was scared. I thought, you know, I really need to bring it. I'm going to have to pull something out. Um, turns out I would have been strong enough anyway but i put so much into the training and uh, i had poundstone helping me with the training and so mm -hmm. my my insanity combined with his crazy oh, yeah. amount of volume oh, uh, yeah. that would have been fine 15 20 years ago, years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, <laughs> I, I made it through all the workouts but it beat the shit out of me and then uh oh, two bet. weeks before the show <laughs> I tweaked my hamstring just a little bit on a frame carry. Um, and I got two world's strongest man. The first event was a loading medley. It was uh, two of those big wine barrel things, and an anvil, and then an 825-pound frame. Oh. Yeah. So I got tested. I got It was a little test at world's strongest man. So on that first event, I run to the anvil, I load it, no problem. Then I come to the barrel. First barrel, I pick it up, and I snap something in my finger. A little crack right here. I've, I've done it before. It's a little pulley tendon. It hurts. It sucks. It fucks your grip up. 
but it was loud. I was like, God damn it. I'm cussing at myself. And I load this barrel and I load the other barrel. I go back and I get the frame. I pick it up. This hand starts opening up. I pick it up again. I make it you know, almost three quarters of the way down the course. And at this point, everybody's screaming for you. So I kind of lose myself in the moment. I'm like, I got to go as far as I can. Don't worry about your hamstring. Just pick it up and go. I pick it up. I take two steps. There went the hamstring. Oh. And I felt that little pop, that just that rip. And we got it. Dang it. Two injuries on the first event first back at World's Strongest Man. It was like, it was like World's Strongest Man was saying, Hey, fuck you. Are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> Are you ready? So, uh, yeah, welcome back. <laughs> Slap you in the face. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I was mad at myself, but I'm, you know, I'm not going to quit. So then I had to get ready for the squat. 705 squash for reps was the next event. Mm. And, uh, I'll be honest, in warm-ups, I almost didn't do the event. I remember talking to the coordinator and telling her, look, I don't I don't know if I can do this one. I might have to drop out. And as soon as I said those words, I said, ooh, yeah, no. no. Yeah. Say, saying, that not gonna, loud, saying that out loud just hits you in a different way, didn't it? It was a disgusting feeling. And I was, I was like, <laughs> man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, so. I went out and I did the event and this is when I realized that I was strong enough because I cranked out three reps and I'm sitting there, I'm getting excited. I'm like, God, this is so easy. I can do 10 reps. No problem. On rep number four, I hit the pads and it bounces me forward just a little bit and it loads that hamstring. I was like, ah, shit. And I had to dump it because I didn't, I didn't want to rip the whole thing off. Um, so that was, yeah, just getting a little ahead of myself and thinking, this is so easy. Ooh, all right. And then, boom. Fuck. <laughs> but you're in the game. Uh, you didn't have to take a zero. Yeah. You're in the game. That's the key. I mean, that's that's the big contest like that. You just got to keep those zeros at bay, you know? Exactly. And that was a uh, – that event had a particular significance to me because in 2011, that was the last event I ever did at Will's Strongest Man. Yeah. And it didn't go very well for me. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, it was, it well. yeah, Nick remembers. <laughs> I think yeah. I threw a little bit of a tantrum. I, I kind of may have said a couple foul words and thrown my belt. I don't know. <laughs> Your belt might have hit the producer? <laughs> Alleged, allegedly, maybe, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um. That, that, she was such a bitch anyway. Jesus Christ. Well, <laughs> you said it. <laughs> I'll disagree with, with your words. She was not the most so, friendly person. She, she and my ex-wife, they were both from England. They did not get along. They hated each other. So that woman made my life miserable every uh, time uh, I was there. She made everybody's life miserable, Travis. She hated, yeah. she, she hated everyone, mm. including the athletes. just mess. Yeah, she's just an unhappy person, you know. Well, anyway, I don't want to trash you. Know, the, the, the best part was no. The best part was um, in China in 2013 when we got out to the remote site. We ran out of water. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, I heard China was a nightmare. Yeah, and so we ran out of water at the site, and uh, Barry Frank was walking around, and there were two of the wives in the medical tent with heat stroke. Oh, and oh, Barry's like, oh, Barry's like, what's going on? Why are they in here? We're like, we're, we have heat stroke. Well, and there's no more water. We can't even give them our water. We get in trouble if we have our water. Barry's like, huh, come with me. Walks around the back, and there's a whole pallet of water in the back for the film crew. Oh. <laughs> so that we got she to take all that. Hiding? Yes. That's yeah. so that's, that's that was her last world strongest man, by the way. <laughs> Well, you so, know, I've got this to say, man. At World's Strongest Man last year, it's I was I was so surprised with with the crew and you know everybody there. It's they were it's awesome. Amazing, they were yeah. they were fucking awesome people. I had such a good time. You know, yeah. they were they were actually cared. They actually you know they did their jobs and they enjoyed yeah. the process. And yeah. they made it they made it more fun for the athletes. They made it just. An incredible experience. So yeah, I was really grateful that I had the and chance. Brother, 
again, listen to this. Listen to the repetitious. In, you know, way back before your problem, you're competing at the highest level, world strongest man, you're having the time of your life. You go down to the depths of almost knocking yourself off and having that moment where you realize you can stand up and move forward all the way climbing, all the way back through crapping in a bucket in a storage unit because you don't have a bathroom, you know, getting yourself off drugs and getting back to world's strongest man, having a great fucking time. If that doesn't summarize this fucking loop, yeah. I don't know what does, my brother, you know? That's exactly it. I'll tell you the, the key, the theme to all of it is gratitude. It's yes. learning gratitude, being grateful for everything. Mm -hmm. You start looking at the world, like I said earlier, I was looking at the world for negative things and everything that I'd lost, everything that had been taken from me. When I finally started focusing on gratitude, I started looking at the world for all the good. It's like I yeah. took off one, one lens and I put on a completely different lens. I'm looking at the same scenery around me, but I'm seeing a completely yeah. different story. Man, right. that, that's, that's the life-changing part. And, and that right there, that is a pearl of advice that can help anybody that's having a tough time. It's just it's just a change of lens, change of perspective, and that's powerful shit, brother. And I got to tell you, exactly. I'm just, me personally, and I know the whole, everybody, we all are, but I just got to say, I thank you in, from the deepest parts of my soul for sharing this, because I know none of this is easy for you to talk about, but you're, the, the, the amount of people that, not only on this show, but you've, you've helped, you know, you've, you've told your story other places too. It's helping people, brother. So again, man, it's, it's, it, it shows how strong you are and how strong your character is to do this and share all this with us. So really fucking cool, brother. <clears throat> now here's a question I got for you. That's it's, I'm really, really interested to hear your answer. Okay. We got a time machine for you. You can climb in that set of a bitch, just like the movie Back to the Future. You can dial in the time and the day. You can go back into your life, you right now, and tell younger Travis one piece of advice. Where, what time? You know, where do you go? What day? What time? What is the old Travis doing? And what is the Travis you are right now? Tell the young Travis. What is that piece of advice? I've thought about this a few times, and. Uh... You know, sometimes I wonder if I'd actually go back in time if I would change anything because I kind of like who I am now. Mm. Uh, you know, now yeah. I know how hard that's I am. That's fucking beautiful, that's, brother. That's a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I've thought about this, and I think the answer would be I would go back to May of 2008, right before I tore my left pec and then decided to compete 12 days later, and then two weeks after that, it the Madison Square Garden, and then a week after that at Fortissimus, I would have told myself, here's one of the warning signs that something's about to go wrong. If you feel that, that muscle has a weakness, if you feel that muscle has a dryness, if you feel something that isn't in the norm, you cut the weight back. You don't fucking go hard. Because what happened was, I did a log workout, and then I had two sets of dumbbell incline press. I was going to do 150 pounds for two sets of 10. I started pressing just the 80s, warming up. I felt this, this weird thing in both of my pec insertions. Um, and I just thought, you know, okay, we'll, we'll go one at a time, and uh, one set at a time, just keep going. I got to the 150s, and I'm cranking them out. And I'm thinking, this feels really weird. Maybe I won't do another set. Maybe I'll just do one set of 15 instead. Rep number 12, boom. I rip half of my my left pec off. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it was like a piece of tape peeling off of the bone and a giant rubber band sack. It was yeah, a gross yeah. feeling. Um, yeah, yeah, it sucks, man. <laughs> yeah, but I never got it fixed because yeah. the day before, Marcel had gotten me a Champions League a flight, $1,200 flight. So I couldn't back out. Um, but if I could go back in time, I would tell myself how to look out for, you know, injuries that are about to happen. Never sacrifice form. And if something feels weird, you stop there. It's okay to I take a that. day and go halfway. 100%. Brother, you know what I love about this answer is you're giving yourself advice as an athlete, 
as you, you're you're basically saying your journey of, of going down where you did and back to where you are was necessary for you to be who you are. And that's fucking yeah. that that's fucking amazing shit right there. Because and and for those that are listening, you wonder why you're at the bottom when you get there. Well, there's a reason you just don't know it yet. So it's time to start piecing it back together, you know. <clears throat> that's uh you know, like I said a minute ago, there's a certain strength in knowing how hard you are to kill. And uh, I wouldn't yeah. want to change that that path. As painful as it was, as, uh, you know, just awful of an experience as it was, I can always say when I die that I did not live a boring life. <laughs> most, people have, most people have. Yes. <laughs> That is true. They've got yes. a, uh, here's their highs, here's their lows. This is their their you know realm of feeling and yeah. existing. I've yeah. had the highest highs, I've had the lowest lows. Oh, I've bro. lived all through here, man. The whole fucking spectrum. <laughs> the whole fucking thing. Well, dude, I gotta tell you, man, this has been and we've had you here for already 90 minutes. It feels like it's been 15 minutes because your story's been so inspiring. Mm -hmm. But uh, one more question before we before we sign off here is uh, everybody knows Travis Ortemeyer, Ortemeyer, the world. I say your name wrong on purpose, by the way. <laughs> I got it that time, though. <laughs> I did. I, inter I introduced your name properly, too. I wasn't going to do that to you at the front of the show. <laughs> anyway, everybody knows you as the world-class athlete that basically – had a little spell away and came back and did it again. So that part that goes down in history, right? But what is the when you're when you're just when you're the physical part of you is gone? What is what is Travis's legacy? What do you want? What do you want to be remembered for? Uh, so I want people to be able to look at my life and realize that they can do anything in theirs. Yes. Because I'm is, just a regular guy. I'm a fat kid. Yeah, I was yeah, dorky kids again. growing up. <laughs> oh, your chicken's you know, killing me again, brother. This is good stuff. There, there was nothing special world. about me. Nice. <laughs> um, oh, there's nothing special about me growing up. There was nothing, you know, I didn't I didn't do anything cool. I didn't have like super athleticism as a kid. I didn't I was just a fat, kind of shy kid and, and you know, humble beginnings, but I made it to the top and then the world got pulled out from under me and I crashed all the way into hell and then managed to claw my way all the way back to the top. And I did that because I just never gave up. I just mm -hmm. kept doing what I love to do and mm -hmm. I refused to step back and say, well, that's it for me, you know. <clears throat> um, and another thing I'd like to be able to leave with people is you know when when life is going bad when things are going wrong people look for a miracle you know they pray to god they ask the universe whatever it is they do but they want a miracle they think it's something external that comes to them <clears throat> now the way i learned to look at it is we're already born with the miracle inside us it only comes out when you realize that it's there you don't have yeah. to wait for someone to grant you your wish or to give you power you just have to realize that you've got the power inside and you've had it all along you just got to stand up and start moving forward that's fucking it understand that it's not going to be a an overnight easy thing to do when i had all that negative uh, momentum going down it took me months a year of constantly thinking positive to start to build my way back up and get to a point where i was actually I had positive momentum. You know, I finally overturned the negativity and moved into positivity and started, you know, taking off in life. That didn't just happen. You know, I didn't, I prayed plenty of times for a miracle, but it wasn't until I realized I've already got it. It's time to start living it and time to stop wishing yeah. for it. Mm -hmm. Take action. Now yeah. is the time because it's already freaking there. That's what well, I'm going to be. Well, brother, I got to tell you, I mean, just by listening to this podcast, I think that they're going to hear that loud and clear. And then with you wrapping up with your final thoughts, that that is the 
that's the that is the pearl that is the takeaway i gotta tell you brother i i can't thank you enough for you know taking the stuff that's hard for you and putting it on the table for other people's benefit you know and uh again i've said this many times i'll say it again it it, it shows it's a true testament to your character and you know i can't thank you enough for coming on here and sharing all this stuff with with us this has been amazing well, i appreciate y'all having me on man it's been fun Oh, you yeah. share with some old buddies. Yeah. <laughs> nice well, to meet a you, new one. <laughs> we've been on we've been on here for ninety minutes. It seems like fifteen, you know. So. I know, I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 yeah. you, 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 you just kind of get you're just kind of getting to know Travis. I, yeah. Tell us what you've been thinking the whole time. I could just, I could see it in your eyes. You're soaking this stuff up. I, you know, I, tell you me know, what I, you're thinking, brother. My, my my first impression when he came on, I wasn't expecting this. Yeah. But uh, you start speaking, <laughs> I was just like no, no, no lie. You start speaking, I'm like, holy shit. Yeah. Like, it was truly <laughs> inspiring, entertaining, and you are one tough, strong, amazing person, man. <laughs> Believe it or not, I, you are. I appreciate you that, are. man. I appreciate that. <laughs> and for you, for, you, for you to go through all of that and still have a smile on your face and, you know, to laugh <laughs> yeah, about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yes, yes. It's, it's a truly inspiring story, man. And I, really I thank cool, you, man. I, I appreciate that. I thank you so much for sharing, man. And I owe you yeah. so much. Yeah. I owe you everything. <laughs> Shit, man. man. We go you way, way back, know. buddy. That's you right. That's you right. I introduced you, you to your wife. <laughs> That's right. That's right. He's over. I gotta tell. I gotta give my man a hug over here. He's having a moment. This is it. That's what this. That's what this is all about, man. This is about real shit. I'm you know? so happy for you. Yeah. It's so. Dude, funny. I appreciate that, brother. I appreciate that. You know, I love yeah. seeing. I love seeing y'all. And uh, it's weird getting to watch people's evolution through a lifetime. You know, I've known y'all longer than I've known any of my friends <laughs> growing up, really. And. Uh, it's just fun to see it, man. I love seeing Nick grow with his family and John grow with his family. And now I get to meet a new guy. I can't wait to see how things go for you in the future, man. This is cool. <laughs> Thank you, man. Well, brother, I got to say, in, you know, in closing, you know, we, we spent a lot of time in the first era of Travis. Let's call it that. And obviously, we spent a lot of time in the second era, so to speak. And you were you were a, a great special person back then, but I got to tell you, brother, all you've been through right now, uh, brother, you you are at the top of the food chain as a human being, and uh, I'm really personally happy to call you my friend. Same. That means a lot to me, man. It Same really here. does. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, bud. Yeah. Could, could Thank you, more bud. Yeah. So I, I'd call I'm you guys sorry. family before I'd say friend. Shit. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. That's it. That's it. Just, just, just keep going, man. Just keep shining. You know. That's it. Hell yeah, man. Yeah. No, yeah. no looking. No looking back. You know what? You know what's funny? I was actually watching this episode of uh, Steve Harvey, and he made a very good point. Right? He said, "When you're in the driver's seat of a car, there's a rearview mirror and there's a windshield. If you keep looking in the rearview mirror, what happens? No, oh, yeah. You, yeah. Start, you start running into shit, right?" <laughs> you on that path right now, my brother? Where all you gotta keep doing is just looking in the windshield. Every once in a while, you can look, so you can look in the rearview mirror. You can, the rear you can look in the rearview mirror and look at the stuff that you pass. You can look in the rearview mirror and look at the stuff that you pass. But always That's remember, it. keep looking in the windshield. That's right. Keep I moving love forward. It. That's the best piece like of advice. That. Keep looking yeah. forward so you don't run yeah. into shit. That's fucking yeah, perfect. Yeah, exactly. That's fucking Keep looking forward, man. <laughs> Real talk. Yeah, yeah, man. Uh, I love I just it. Let's look forward. I can share some of this wisdom with yeah. Uh, yeah. with my clients. You know, I, I'd mm -hmm. like to make sure that they don't have to take the same pitfalls and mistakes yeah. that I've yeah. made. <laughs> yeah. Well, before we close, before we wrap up shop here, brother, you know, tell everybody what you're doing and uh, what's next for. What's next for Big Travis Ortmeyer? Uh, you know, I, I do a lot of online coaching. I love, I love, love working with athletes and sharing my passion. That's that's one of my yeah. favorite things. Mm -hmm. um, 
as and far he's as from some good coaches too, so he's got some good knowledge. He's actually right. learned from some good coaches. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And I keep these coaches because even coaches need coaches, and I know That's that exactly right. That's I am right. absolutely no no exception to that rule because I gotta have somebody rain in my crazy ass head. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. That's uh, it. But hopefully, hopefully, we go to World Strongest Man this year. Hopefully, I get another shot to to prove myself because last year I was there. I got my feet wet. It was so overwhelming. I just, I didn't perform as well as I wanted to. Well, I brother, think let I me tell you something. Better. I can pretty, I'll bet my left arm that you'll be a world's strongest man again. That's not a question. You're only 40. That's not a question. It's not if it's when. So let's yeah. just leave that whole thing yeah. alone. It's not, it's not the cross is fair. It's just when's it coming again? That's the only question, bro. So just All like, right. Ock, like just that. like Ock said, you just keep doing what you're doing, man. Because yeah. you know this has been <laughs> fucking awesome. I'm getting chicken skin again. Jesus Christ, you know. And it's not like I haven't heard this story before. You're my buddy. We've talked about it, but the way that you're putting it out for the people is just it's fucking lighting my heart up, man. It's this is inspiring shit. So, brother, again. That's thank awesome. you. We all thank you. We all had a great fucking time. And uh, there you have it, everyone. There's another hey, edition. Who, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, I'm saying, who, who's to say, man? You, you might, you might, you might be able to try to get sell that story to Netflix or, or somebody that want to make a movie out of this shit. Yeah, it's a very inspiring <laughs> story, man. Yes, very true. I've been, I've been told story. to write a book. I may, I may write a book someday. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Yeah, absolutely. Why not? Absolutely. You have, you have, totally you have, you have, a, you have a story to tell, and, and a lot of people would be interested in, in, in hearing it, man. So why not? Yeah. You, you, know, got, you got, you got nothing to lose. If, you got if to it lose. can help people, stuff in there. if it can help people, dude, it, I just, if it can help people, it kind of, I wouldn't say it makes it all worth it, because goddamn, I swear that none of that shit's worth it. It sucks so bad, but it certainly <laughs> makes the burden a lot easier to bear. If I'm yeah, helping yeah. others through their process, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, and I, I agree with Ock. You should, you should totally do something like that. But I just, again, you've been telling your story. You told it on World's Strongest Man. You're telling it again here today. You've told it in a lot of other platforms. So, brother, you're doing great work with helping people, and I fucking love you for it. So keep up the good work, man. I appreciate, it, man. It was a lot of fun being on. It's good to talk to you guys. Well, I guarantee you, you're coming back. So, you know, we're, you're one of those you're, you're right. one of those guests that you that you got no choice. Even if I got to come to your house and sit next to you, like I'm doing, but oh, we'll, we'll drive up. That's right, we'll do it together. If you say if you say no, we're gonna fly Ock out here. We're gonna get Ock from the East Coast, and we're gonna road trip with you. We're gonna tie you down and do another episode because that's how good this Let's show is. Let's do it, man. Let's do it. Right I love on, it, everyone. man. <laughs> All right. Well, there you have it, everyone. Another edition of Legends of Iron, our first live show. And I cannot think of a better way to kick it off with our guest today, Travis Ortmar, telling everything about his journey. You know, here again, we're here to be real. We're here to be raw. We're here to inspire you to become the best version of yourself. And I don't know how today's episode cannot help you have a better look at life in some way, shape, or form. So again, everyone, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Legends of Iron is brought to you by Muscle Mass, the creator of Nitro Test. Nitro Test is hands down the most fucking kick-ass free workout on the market. If you fucking want some, come fucking get some. Can you handle it? <laughs> <laughs>